Um, reverse 911. So we're working with our dispatch center to work through a reverse 911 system to notify communities. And we're trying to get it so it would be zones. So if we're evacuating the trailer section, they would get a call first as opposed to Lamoille. And so we're working on that to get that reverse 911 to work the way it should. Uh, we also post those on social media. Uh, we'll get a hold of the radio station or the news station saying, hey, there's a fire here. They're evacuating. That also means stay out. Don't go be a curious non-producer. Um, so there's a couple different programs with that. And I may tap in Alex when he talks. So there's what we've discovered over the last couple of years in the fire service is that when they're evacuating homes or communities, there's a lot more people than we know about that can't move out on their own. Kids that stay home during the day alone or just they're not mobile. Um, like the fire in Colorado, an example is <clears throat> they were getting a lot of 911 calls of people didn't know how to get out of their garage because the power was out. So there were dispatchers talking them through, see the red handle, pull it, then lift up your garage. There's some people that don't know those things. There was a lot of, hey, I have a paraplegic that needs help moving out. With that program, if you have a medical condition or something along those lines that you need assistance when the power goes out or when there's a fire and they're evacuating, there's a Green Cross program through Envy Energy and they can sign up through through Alex, or uh, yeah, I believe you can go online and there's a Green Cross, NV Energy Green Cross program. And so that notifies the power company, uh, the fire agencies, we have access to that database that shows us where the Green Cross homes are and tells us what kind of condition it is, what they need help getting out, things like that. I don't think in Elko County, we have any other programs like that maybe through the gas company or your prone paint company, you can, you can notify them as well, but we don't receive some of that information as the fire district. Um, so when we ask you to evacuate, if you can get out, you get out. What do you take with you? Medication, water, dogs, pets. Are we taking the TV off the wall? if it's in your go bag. So when Jamie gets up and talks, she's gonna talk about a go bag and there's some checklists that you can work through to make sure that your go bag is ready for your evacuation and for ready for you to leave. It talks about the important documents to have, your medications, um, important phone numbers, insurance policies, things like that, that if you do lose your home, it makes your life easier in the back end. Phone charger, it's always a good thing um where to go so if you live in spring creek you're already well aware of our one way in the spring creek one way out um if the fire's burning on the summit don't drive to the summit you're just going to add to the people on the summit uh one of the areas we identify is the spring creek high school is an evacuation center and so people can just come here what happens a lot during wildland fires is people will think, oh, I got to get to Elko, or if I'm in Elko, I got to go somewhere else. They'll take their route that they know about, and then that ends up blocking our back routes and our second routes in, to and from the fires. So knowing your evacuation route, it's kind of practicing it. If you're going to evacuate uh, Spring Creek Horse Palace and the Elko rodeo grounds, the, the fairgrounds, is identified as large animal evacuation centers. Uh, they're not prepared to take small animals such as dogs and cats. Some of our vets office as well, but we don't have formal agreements with them, but we can contact them. They can help take care of those, help provide us some, some uh, cages for them so that if we can get them in certain areas. But for us, the primary areas here are the horse palace and the fairgrounds for large animal evacuations. And when we, uh make those notifications you pretty much just show up they'll tell you where to go and make it pretty easy on you is there anything i'm missing about evacuations for us on the response side we're working on our first 911. 
So we have Elko County Fire. We post on our Facebook every time there's an incident. Uh, Elko Interagency Dispatch also. We try and use those same two primarily to promote the same message. So if one of us posts it, they'll share it. Um, KELK and KENV will also share the information. Salt Lake News has started to pick up a lot of our stuff as well. Um, or, is that better? Okay, I'll stop wandering. Uh, the Salt Lake News has started to pick up some of our stuff and our local news stations here will share it with them to start promoting that um, information. Something that you guys may not know is in Elko, our primary news comes out of Salt Lake. We don't get Reno news. Where are you out of? Elko, got it, perfect. She'll promote for us. Anything else? It's also me, I'll just keep going. So I'm now Matt Peterson still talking about fuels work here in Elko County. So uh, Elko County, about a year ago, started up a wildland fuels reduction division in partnership with NB Energy. Um, and we work with the state very close. We work with BLM and the Forest Service to start promoting projects. Um, and what we can do is, we primarily are starting to treat uh, power lines and infrastructure area. Uh, it was something that was identified as a high hazard for us is power lines starting wildland fires um, in Elko County, in Nevada, in California, all throughout the West. And so NV Energy took a very aggressive stance and said, we're gonna partner with our local fire departments and they're gonna do the work with us, not for us, we're gonna do it with us. And so with that, they added, we can add up to 22 firefighters in Elko County. And so that's a pretty massive workload that we can take on and add to our workforce, not only for fuels reduction, but for fire response as well. A um, couple of the crews back, those are those crews, and then also up here up. And so how that works is we've identified the number one areas that we need to treat, which feed communities power or their high hazard that we're treating first. And how we do those is we'll mow along the power lines to whatever the right of way is in that certain area. Some areas it's pretty small, 15 or 20 feet. In other areas, it goes as wide as 175. If you guys, the homeowners, agree for us to go farther, it makes sense for us to do it. It makes sense for you to do it. Uh, with that, so we'll mow it. We'll hand grub the mineral soil around the power infrastructure. So if it's a power box or a power pole, we'll create a, a dirt around there so that if that piece of equipment does fail, it just showers on dirt, not. Um, we'll also come back in and we'll do weed treatments at certain times of the years to prevent evasion of species and, and prevent the vegetation from growing back pretty aggressively. If you guys have noticed when you commute into Elko every day from Spring Creek, there's the power line that goes right past quarries all the way up and over the mountain. That's one of our first projects. And we kind of chose that one as a visual aid to everything that we're doing. We're doing that around communities. We're doing it through communities. Um, we're doing it in Elko, Spring Creek, White Rock, Rendon, uh, pretty much anywhere in Elko County that has the need. So response wise, I'll bring my notes over here so I keep walking out of it. So we have, uh, our career stations in Elko, uh, Spring Creek, Wells, and Jackpot for Elko County. For the, our wildland division, we've also added additional response. So that's four additional fire engines, a tactical water tender, uh, and a dozer that is available for fire response and fuels work within Elko County. So also through this partnership and through partnership with Nevada Division of Forestry, we're doing community wildland fire protection plans. And so We'll go through each community within the county and evaluate what the high hazards are, how we can make that community safer, what we can do to improve our response as fire agencies, what we do to access water better in the communities, and what we can also do to maintain infrastructure if a fire does impact that community. So roads, water, power, communications, 
so that we're able to keep that community functioning and we don't lose a whole community during an event. Yeah. So I believe Alex is gonna talk about some high hazard areas. He's got the tech. Like I just know how to use an iPhone. He runs everything else. But yeah, so Alex will talk about those high hazard areas uh, that they've identified and we've identified with, I believe, I don't know if Coralie's going to talk about it or not, but the state has a program on their website too that you can go through and look at your address. You can look at if you're in a high hazard area, what your primary vegetation or fuels are around it, what your risks are. Um, I'll let her talk about that and not steal her glory. Do you want to talk about defensible space inspections? So... Elko County, we provide uh, defensible space inspections to call and request it. Uh, we're hoping to get an online uh, feature available to you soon where you can request the, an inspection. We'll come to your home. We'll walk through it with you. Um, some people are hesitant about it because they think we're coming in. We're not code enforcement. We're here to see if your house is safe and if it would survive a fire. So we'll give you um pointers on how to make your house more resilient how to harden your house uh how to create a better defensible space but jamie's going to talk about that in depth later so i won't steal that but we do that service you can either call our office and that phone number is 738-9960 anything else So within our fuels program, we don't, well, actually we do. I take that back. So we have some of our volunteer firefighters that go around and publicize and hang up signs and banners and they'll go do uh, public education for us for wildland fire, just education. Uh, but we're always looking for volunteers to join our departments. We have a department in almost every single community in Elko County and they're never hurting for people. If anybody ever wants to do it, that is also available on our website, or you can call our office and we'll point you in the right direction of who to talk to. I'd like to introduce Alex Hewn. Alex is going from NV Energy, and he'll go ahead now and talk about um, the public safety outage management and, and what NV Energy is doing to reduce outage, uh, any problems with reducing fuels and that kind of thing. Thank you. Presentation. Thank you. There we go. Oh, there you go. Okay, perfect. Okay, good evening, everybody. My name is Alex Hoon. I'm the senior meteorologist for MV Energy. And uh, I actually have spent the last 17 years of my career working for the National Weather Service in Reno. And uh, my, my background is especially in uh, fire weather. And so I've been going out on working with uh, firefighters across the state and across the West uh, doing uh, fire weather forecasting and uh, giving the information to the firefighters so that they can make uh, informed decisions to keep people safe and keep their firefighters on the safe, uh, safe on the ground as well. And uh, so now I'm working for NV Energy. Uh, our, our program that I'm going to be talking about today is the Natural Disaster Protection Program and uh, our Public Safety Outage Management or PSOM program that we have along with some of the fuels reduction projects and, and uh, all the other uh, types of work that we're doing with uh, our NDP program. So this, uh, this program is actually really unique. Uh, we're, the only, we're the only power company in, in the entire country, maybe in the entire world, that's actually doing it like this, uh, working with our, our local fire uh, departments, 
with working together with the state and uh, with our, our federal partners as well. So this is actually a, a really exciting program for, uh, for MV Energy and uh, for our state. And so um, the Natural Disaster Protection Program uh, was developed to, for the, the safety of our customers and our communities. And uh, it's actually the uh, highest priority for, for MV Energy. And uh, we, the changes in climate uh, over the last you know, 10, 20 years, we've seen that there's an increased risk of wildfires across, across the, the Western US. Uh, you guys have, have seen how the fires, not only are we getting more wildfires, but the fires are burning hotter, faster, larger, and becoming more destructive as well. And so in 2019, MV Energy actually supported the Senate Bill 329, which was passed by the state legislature of Nevada, that uh, called for the utility, for called for MV Energy in specific to, to actually develop this natural disaster protection plan. And so MV Energy has been working, uh, we've been working with uh, our local fire departments across the state, our NDF, the Nevada Division of Forestry, as well as the BLM and the Forest Service to, uh, to implement this project, this, uh, to reduce the, the wildfire risk across the state uh, from, from our power infrastructure. And so, um, so yeah, we've been working for, with all of our agencies uh, we've added, actually, uh, as, as Matt was saying, we've added 22 firefighters uh, right here in El Elko County. Across the state of Nevada, we've actually added uh, a total of 200 firefighters across the state of, of Nevada. So we're, we're actually not, we're not taking firefighters out of the fire stations that are already there. We're actually adding to the rosters of, of all the local fire departments. And uh, MV Energy is actually paying for all of this to, to get, not only for their positions, but also for all of their equipment, the, their engines, uh, masticators, chippers, uh, PPE, all the other equipment that they need to do their to do their work safely. And so, um, as at the company, we've actually hired two fire mitigation specialists and uh, hired one fire weather specialist, meteorologist. And uh, so, uh, we're a, a team of not only uh, this fire side. But we have emergency as well, and, and we also have a GIS works with us. And um, let's see here, and we have a bunch of project managers that uh, help this project this plan. You know, all all of the work that needs to be done of modernizing the infrastructure to make it fire safe for the communities. And so, what what we do. Uh, one of the main ways that we do is uh, we use covered conductor. So the, the, the actual power lines that are overhead, whenever it's a deeply forested area, will actually replace those, those exposed lines, it, replace it with a plastic covered, it, it has a coating over the power line, and it, it actually helps to, uh, if, if there were a tree branch or a tree actually falling down onto the power lines, it actually keeps the, there's no sparks that, that happen. It would actually come down and pull the power line down um, and it would actually turn it off in a, in a safe way. So there wouldn't be a big shower of, of uh, sparks like such as, you know, if it was an exposed power line. And so that actually uh, the risk of wildfires and uh, we uh, non-expulsion fuses this is actually a really important part because uh, the the old way of doing things, you would you would have a, a fuse that was you know up in the air on the power pole, and if the fuse blew, it would actually cause an explosion of molten metal, and it would shower in, in all different directions and, and potentially create a fire. And so we're actually replacing all of those fuses with what we call non-expulsion fuses, and so the fuses actually explode within a vacuum. And so, uh, so it doesn't cause a, a big shower of sparks. It still acts as a fuse and it'll turn off the power if there was a fault on the line, but it just doesn't, uh, it, it's way more safe for, for preventing uh, potential wildfire. Uh, we're, some of the other work that we're doing, we're also replacing wood poles with iron and steel poles. We're actually rebuilding a lot of uh, some of the oldest circuits in the state. Uh, there are many circuits here in Nevada that are, 80, 90, 100 years old. They've been, they've been there for a very, very long time. So just modernizing, modernizing those circuits 
and uh, replacing those uh, as needed. And so uh, some of the other things are uh, tree attachments. Uh, oddly enough, tree attachments that back in the day, that was a very common thing. You would actually put a power line and actually attach it to a tree with an insulator, and then it would go into some per, into a person's house. Very, very dangerous way of, of uh, doing things. But, you know, 50 years ago, they didn't really think of, they weren't thinking about the wildland fire part of things. So we're actually re removing, eliminating all tree attachments across the state. We're using, uh, we're using drones to inspect the inspect all of the equipment and the vegetation all across the entire state of Nevada, especially in our extreme and high fire danger areas. There's a, uh, in total, there's about 44,000 miles of, of power lines in Nevada. So you can imagine how, how huge this, this undertaking is. And then some of the highest risk circuits, uh, we're actually looking at undergrounding some of those circuits as well. Uh, undergrounding is, is a very, uh, it seems like that's the easy way to do it. Oh, well, you know, why don't you just go in and underground all the circuits? Well, um, in in a place where uh, there's already sidewalks and streets and driveways, it would it creates a huge problem uh, to to dig all that up and to actually underground it. Very 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 expensive. But um, there are other ways to mitigate the fire danger besides undergrounding, but some of those places we do in the highest, most extreme areas, we will be looking at, at undergrounding those areas. And so, uh, and then the last part is the, the implementation of the public safety outage management. And so public safety outage management is, uh, is I'm gonna talk about here a little bit more in detail, but that's actually when we proactively de-energize certain areas, if the extreme conditions, if there's an extreme wind and extreme fire danger, uh, we will actually look at preemptively shutting down power. That is the last and final, uh, th that is our, uh, basically it's our last resort. You know, we're, we don't want to shut off the power. That's only under the most extreme conditions, but all of this other, all of these other ways of, of mitigating the fire is where we want to go first before uh, we actually shut down power. And so, uh, since 2019, uh, we replaced uh, or we've inspected nearly 40,000 wooden poles in those extreme and high fire risk areas. We've increased the frequency of vegetation management cycles. Uh, our partnerships with our local fire agencies, uh, Elko County, NDF, and uh, now with the Forest Service and BLM and, and other agencies across the state, uh, we're actually helping to reduce the fuel loading, the 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 uh, reduce the, the vegetation that is within the right-of-ways of, of our power lines. But uh, like Matt was saying, not just underneath the power lines, but actually 175 feet on either side, we can actually do fuels reduction. Not, it's not clear. It's, it's not a clear cutting. It's actually going through and doing a healthy forest management and uh, really like reducing the fuel load so that if there were a fire to start, it wouldn't turn into a raging inferno it would actually turn into a small uh, ground fire, and, which would be very easy to, to extinguish. And so some of the other things that we've done is uh, we've actually re removed about 37,000 unhealthy or hazard trees across the state so far. Uh, a lot of these uh, in, you know, have been either trimmed or removed for safety. And uh, we've also installed 65 weather stations across the state of Nevada, as well as 11 wildfire alert cameras that uh, that help us to increase our situational awareness for potential wildfires in the state. Uh, four of those weather stations are, are right here in Elko, and they were actually, they're actually just installed a couple of weeks ago. So they're brand, brand new here in Elko. And then we have two weather stations out in uh, Winnemucca, one in Winnemucca and one in Paradise Valley. So some of the fuels mitigation and treatment that, that we've been doing yeah, I was telling you guys about uh, doing these resilient corridors. And so we can actually go out all the way to a thousand feet of clearance from the, from the infrastructure to actually re reduce the fuel amounts and uh, help to reduce that, that potential fire behavior that we get from heavy fuels. We've done targeted grazing, about 300 acres targeted grazing across the state. We actually just started a, uh, a program, I believe, 
a few months ago of uh, the Salt Lick program here in, in Nevada, in Elko County. Uh, some of the ranchers have uh, agreed to put uh, salt licks within the right-of-ways of, of the uh, power lines. And so then the, the cattle will actually come in to the salt lick and actually help to graze those areas around the, the power infrastructure. And so th this is something brand new. This has never been done before. And so uh, that, that reduces the fuel loading. And if there is a fire along those right-of-ways, it helps to reduce the potential for for a, a wildfire. Uh, we've also began doing a, a logging program up in Lake Tahoe for uh, 9,000 acres of logging that's gonna be uh, occurring in and around uh, the power infrastructure up there in Tahoe. And uh, we've, we've uh, matched $11 million in grants for vegetation treatments across the state. Uh, we've also done a bunch of fuel and mapping. And uh, like, like Matt was saying, the pole grubbing and right-of-way clearing of over 12,000, I think that number is way, way more than that now. We're probably pushing 20,000 poles by now. And our acres treated, uh, we did, we had 12,000 acres, uh, but we're probably closer to uh, 18,000 by now. And uh, tree trimming along uh, 1,147 miles of overhead lines. So uh, the public safety outage management. Now this is, uh, like I said, this is our last line of defense for a potential uh, fire. Now uh, it's been shown, you know, scientifically, statistically, there, there winds, when the winds begin to exceed 50, 60 miles per hour, the chances for power lines uh, to ignite a fire goes up exponentially. So that doesn't necessarily mean if you have a red flag warning in effect, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be shutting off power. It's, it's only for the most extreme of the extreme wind events. So think about it as, you know, when you're, we're seeing those wind gusts of well over 60 miles per hour. And if the fuels are receptive, then that's when we're, we're looking at doing a potential de-energization. Now, uh, during a PSOM event, PSOM stands for Public Safety Outage Management. During one of those uh, events, we will actually te temporarily shut down power for safety in order to prevent any power lines or potentially debris. The power lines, uh, power line fires is actually not the power lines themselves. It's actually debris that flies into the power lines that can cause the fires. Uh, sometimes it can be a person's umbrella or some something... Uh, like a, a trampoline or, or a balloons from a kid's party, you know, something like that flies into a power line that can cause a shower of sparks and potentially start a new wildfire. And so this PSOM, uh, PSOM was first approved for use in Nevada by the, the state legislature in 2019, uh, encompassing especially for the Lake Tahoe Basin or Mount Charleston down in Southern Nevada. And then in 2020, several wildfires demonstrated the risk that there is a, a, a risk for wildfire that exists outside of those Lake Tahoe and Mount Charleston areas. So, so we actually received approval from the Public Utilities Commission to create 20, 21 new PSOM zones across the state. And those PSOM zones, now uh, I pulled up Lake Tahoe over here to, to just show you guys the difference between our extreme fire risk zones these extreme fire risk zones have a very strict, very, very strict uh, wind and fuels criteria. And when we meet that criteria, we are obligated to de-energize those areas of Lake Tahoe. Now, over here, our elevated fire risk zones, they're more of a, there's more quant qualitative information that goes into a potential piece on. Now, uh, we have two areas that have been identified in Elko County. There's the Elko PDZ, which is right up along I-80, runs up the, runs up the uh, what's that called, the uh, Mount, Mountain View Highway, uh, Mount City, Mountain City Highway, runs up all the way to Tuscarora and almost up to Wild Horse, um, pretty much up to the Wild Horse Reservoir. And then there's a Spring Creek area that is down uh, just to the southeast of Elko, and then actually comes up all the way into Lamoille as well. And so those are our two areas that have been identified for Elko County for potential de-energization. And if those 
those extreme conditions were to be met, we would actually begin consulting with uh, Elko County Fire, NDF, BLM, Forest Service, and uh, consulting with, uh, with our partners to, you know, is this a potential event that, that we would need to de-energize, right? So we, we, we don't make these decisions in a vacuum, right? Each PSOM zone is monitored individually. The PSOM event is called, uh, is usually for each individual zone. So like sometimes if, if there was a situation where the Spring Creek area wasn't going to see the winds, but Elko was gonna see the winds, then we, we may de-energize portions of Elko, but not portions of Spring, uh, Spring Creek. And, uh, <clears throat> during these areas, we can actually, we'll actually call out We'll do customer notifications for everyone that's that's included in that in that zone, and uh, make sure that you guys have you know several days of notification. So we try to notify people three days ahead of time for a potential event, and then give you give you several days to prepare for for one of these these major events. Uh, if we do de-energize, we can also de-energize partial zones, which which is actually really unique because we can actually shut down parts of circuits that are gonna see those most extreme conditions, but leave power on for other folks. And so the criteria is, like I was saying, for, for this Elko and Spring Creek area, it's very qualitative because we're, we're actually looking at uh, wind speed, we're looking at fuel dryness, and we're looking at the duration of the event. You know, If the event is only going to, going to occur for a couple of hours, okay, that's, that's probably not that big of a deal. But the longer the duration of the event, if it's going to be a 12 hour event, then that is going to have a much higher impact to, to the region. We also look at the condition of the vegetation in and around our right of ways. And as we begin, you know, as we continue to do our, our program of vegetation management and fuels reduction, you know, the, the more fuels reduction we do, the better, the better condition the power lines are and the less chance of a potential fire there is. Uh, we also take input from our key customers. We uh, do we look at the readiness of our utilities and telecommunication providers. We take field observations and input from our local fire agencies. We speak with the National Weather Service. Um, I'm I'm very good friends with uh, the folks right here in the Elko National Weather Service, and uh, and so we'll we'll actually get their their inputs as well. And then we look at the, our customer resource center readiness and the condition of our, of our infrastructure. It, has our infrastructure been updated recently? And so all of these qualitative factors help to determine if a PSOM event is needed in these, these specific zones in Elko and Spring, Spring Creek. And so uh, I wanna speak a little bit of our customer support that we provide. If we were to de-energize uh, an area, so we would actually, MV Energy will come in and set up these customer resource centers. And I believe that Spring Creek High School has been identified as one of those customer resource center locations. And then uh, there would be another area probably at the Elko High School or uh, somewhere that near, uh, somewhere in, in the Elko area. So there would actually be two customer resource centers, one, one in Spring Creek and one in Elko. And uh, we would actually provide bags of ice. We would provide water, light snacks, charging devices for folks that, you know, if we de-energize, you know, you got to charge your phones up, right? Uh, we would provide access to Wi-Fi and uh, in general power as well. Uh, Matt touched on the Green Cross customers. So we, we uh, have a very important uh, part to play for our, our customers, members of the community that if you're depending on 24-7 life supporting medical equipment, right? We will actually either, one of two things, either we will set up a personal generator at your house uh, if, if, that, if you qualify for that, or we will set you up in accommodations at a, at a local hotel during the, uh, during the de-energization uh, event. Now, uh, the Green Cross customers, I have a phone number here, uh, if you guys, feel that, uh, that you might maybe qualified or someone in your household may be dependent on uh, the 24 seven medical care. I have a phone number here for you guys. The phone number is 775-834-4444. Four, 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 four. 
And uh, if you call that number, we'll actually set you up with a, uh, a representative. We'll actually set you up with a packet uh, that you fill out, and then we'll get you set up as a, as a uh, Green Cross customer. So uh, some of the other customer support that we do as well is we, we set up a cell on wheels. Uh, cell on wheels is a, it's a, it's a mobile unit that it sets up a mast and actually runs off a generator and it actually helps to boost the cell phone signal in the region. Uh, what happens is uh, we've, we've seen that if we de-energize, when we de-energize areas, every, you know, everybody's cell phone goes off of Wi-Fi and then begins hitting the cell phone towers. And so what happens is the cell phone towers get overwhelmed. And so when we, we will actually set up these cell phone cell on wheels or what we call a cow, cow cell on wheels, right? Uh, we'll set up a cow and that will actually help to boost the cell phone signal around, around the area. We also work with our telecommunication providers uh, so that they can provide infrastructures uh, uh, generators for their infrastructures. So like, so the cell phone towers, the cell phone towers typically have a backup generator and they may have uh, fuel in those generators for, you know, 10 or 12 hours, but we actually provide them with extra generators to be able to make sure that the, the cell phone towers continue to work throughout the event. Uh, and then lastly, during one of these events, you know, there's uh, the community obviously has concerns of a potential for, uh, you know, if, if all of the power is out, you know, is, are people going to come and mess with our home? You know, uh, are they going to come and, and rob our place? Well, we, we actually secure additional law enforcement from, from other areas and we bring them in during these PSOM events and uh, additional law enforcement will be out on patrol during these events uh, in case of a de-energization. And so uh, there, there was a question, one, one last question was uh, about the, uh, what, what kind of technology are we using to identify those areas of, of high fire danger? Uh, I actually don't have those slides with me today, but uh, basically we're, we're actually uh, using a wildfire analysis software called TechnoSilva. It's actually very state of the art. Uh, it's, it's some of the, uh, the, the most uh, advanced software that we can use for modeling weather and fire behavior. And what that does is actually takes all of our power infrastructure, all of the areas around uh, the state of Nevada, and it looks at all of the vegetation and the vegetation type. You know, some areas have grass and sagebrush, some areas have pinyon juniper, some areas have, uh, you know, 100 foot pine trees. And so depending on the type of fuel that's in the area, it will actually give it and it will assign a potential uh, wildland fire danger, right? And it looks at the last 30 years of weather data, and then it, it, it com combines the last 30 years of weather data and fuels data, like the fuel moisture, live fuel moisture, dead fuel moisture. And it actually takes all that data and, and it assigns areas a, a, risk, a, a risk metric. And that risk metric is, is what we're going to be using and I say that we're going we're going to because we are just implementing this. This is just starting this year, and so we'll actually be able to look and and rack and stack different areas based off of the fire danger. Which are the areas of the highest priority? Which power lines need to be updated first? Which areas need to be undergrounded? Which areas need to have uh, covered conductor? Which areas need to have vegetation management? Um, and so all of that information, you know, it's very high, highly sophisticated uh, software, and we're really excited to bring it on for MV Energy because I, I, we're going to be able to share that information with all of our local, state, and federal partners as well. So uh, that's all I have, and I probably totally went over time. If you guys have any questions, uh, please email us at ndpp at nvenergy.com. Uh, we'd be happy to, to answer your questions. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. I learned a lot, so we appreciate you being here. Our next speaker is Jamie Royce Gomes. Jamie is with our UNR Extension Living with Fire program, and um, Jamie is an award-winning faculty member as well. She just received a, a high honor with our college uh, in May. Oh, oh shucks. Thanks, Jill. Um, 
So uh, again, uh, Jamie Royce Gomes, manager of the Living with Fire program, um, and I am going to be talking to you about defensible space, home hardening, and I'm going to also give a few tips about evacuation. So I'm going to move this. Um, okay, so so what have we learned from communities that have been devastated from? Um, what have we learned? Well, we have learned that as um, flames spread from one home to another, um, embers uh, land from one structure to another. And the major contributing factors to these homes being destroyed are um, lack of defensible space and fire vulnerable construction materials or home hardening. Um, and so I just wanted to start off with um, the, the three ways that, that homes can burn. Um, the first way is radiant heat. So let's say that you have this really intense flame burning. Um, oops, I did that, sorry. So let's say you have a really intense flame burning. Um, and then just the, the heat coming from that flame will cause the home to just combust without the flames touching it. Uh, the second way, it's the picture underneath, is direct flame contact. So let's say that my body's a tree and I have a branch out and it's touching a building and um, fire will fill the branch and it will ignite the home. And the third way, and this is the most common way that homes are ignited, um, research suggests that 60 to 90% of the time homes ignite due to embers or pieces of burning material that um, can travel a mile or more ahead of a, a fire front. It can land on, in, or around something flammable and then ignite. Um, ways to reduce the, the wildfire threat from ember ignition. And so it's, it's also really, really important to consider um, when you implement defensible space concepts along with home hardening concepts together, that can really help to reduce the wildfire threat. Um, I, I constantly hear the media say, you know, you really need to do defensible space. And yes, you do, but you should also be doing home hardening tactics too. So we're gonna go over both of those. Um, so what is defensible space? Um, it is the area between a home and an oncoming wildfire where the vegetation has been managed to reduce the wildfire threat. It also offers a, a, an area for firefighters to safely defend the home. And so um, I really like this picture. Um, this picture is from the Carson City Waterfall Fire. 2004, and I know it's not in this area, but I really like this picture because it shows a home before, during, and after a wildfire. Um, and so the before picture is on the left, and you can see that this house has a wood shake or shingle roof, which is, is very flammable. We don't recommend having that. Um, but in the center picture, oh, sorry, on the first picture, you can also see that they have heavy vegetation. They have bitter brush, they have sagebrush, and it's really dense. And in the middle picture, you can see that they've done a lot of work. They traded out the, that wood shake or shingle roof um, to a tile. Um, they also reduced those fuels and they now have um, green irrigated grass. And then um, the far right picture is the after. And so, um, you know, doing these things can definitely help to reduce the wildfire threat. Um, so I, I just have to add that, um, so every home is different. Every home has different vegetation type around it. Every home has a, a different slope, like whether you have zero slope or you have a, a, a really steep slope. Um, we, we know that uh, fire travels faster uphill. And if you have a slope um, you know, by your house, that will impact um, your home's vulnerability. Um, different homes have different aspects. Um, you know, I mean, my house, has, the front yard is south facing. That means that I'm gonna get more sun and more of that vegetation is gonna get dried out. And so um, conversely, in my backyard, I have a north facing um, backyard and it's lush, it's super green. Um, it's, it's amazing in our backyard. Um, so, I mean, when, when somebody comes out and does a defensible space inspection, um, they're gonna assess all these things. And so what I'm gonna go over is just general information about defensible space. Um, again, I really urge you to go get a defensible space inspection. Again, it's just a recommendation. You're not going to be, you know, held liable or anything like that. They're just recommendation to, to reduce the wildfire threat. And I also want to give um, Elko Fire Protection District a, a props. I mean, I, you know, the Living with Fire program is a statewide program. Sometimes there's local residents that reach out to us and say, 
I'd really like a defensible space inspection. And, and sometimes those local agencies don't do defensible space inspections. So then I have to go to you know the state, somebody at the Nevada Division of Forestry and, and beg them, can, can you go out to this resident's house and give it? Um, but you know, Elko Fire, they do do it. So it's awesome, they do. And you should really take advantage of those resources. Um, so in defensible space, there are um, three zones that we're gonna go over. Um, the zero to five foot feet zone from your house. So zero to five feet footprint around your house. Uh, we call that the ember resistant zone. Some people call it different names, but we'll, you know, we'll just go over, you know, zero to five feet. So from zero to five feet, it is critical that you have um, removed all combustibles. So you, you don't want to have wood mulch. You don't want to have wood bark. You, you want to remove uh, the dried leaves, the dried pine needles around in this area. Um, and, um, you know, instead have non-combustible items like DG, decomposed granite. You wanna have pavers, rocks, stuff like that. Um, I do have to mention that there are no fireproof plants out there. Um, you know, when plants are subjected to enough heat for long enough time, they will ignite. Um, but there are some plants that they take longer to burn. Um, and so those plants, if you just have some plants within your zero to five foot range around your home, we recommend having something with high moisture content like tulips, irises, um, succulents, things like that. Things that, that are herbaceous, meaning non-woody, and it just has high moisture content. Those are those would be recommended within the zero to five zone. Um, also in this zero to five foot zone, we, we don't recommend that you, you put piles of wood next to your house too. That's where embers can then go into the wood piles and then ignite. Okay, the... The next zone is the five foot to 30 foot zone. It's called the lean, clean, and green zone. And so this zone, um, lean means that you have only a small amount of flammable vegetation present, if any. Um, clean means that you've gotten rid of all of your dead vegetation. And, and green means that you have this area well ir irrigated. Um, so, I mean, you know, there's grasses, um, you know, you see a deciduous tree there. Um, again, every home is different. Um, so again, I recommend getting a defensible space inspection. And then the reduced fuel zone. This is um, 30 feet um, to 100 plus. Sometimes your defensible space needs to extend more than 100 feet, depending upon your slope. We'll, we'll be talking about that in a later slide. But um, basically in this zone, you know, you want to thin out your, your sage, um, thin out your, your trees, um, and uh, you wanna get rid of your, your dead vegetation. And I'm gonna talk more about the spacing between shrubs and trees. Um, so sometimes folks have backyards that look like this. Um, and, and just like as Alex has said, like we do not want you to clear cut this. Um, when you clear cut things, you're gonna open yourself up for infestation of invasive weeds, for erosion, um, but we wanna space this properly. And so we recommend um, twice the height between shrubs. So let's pretend that this is a picture of a, um, a sagebrush and it's two feet tall. So then you multiply that by two and then ensure that there's four feet spacing between those shrubs. Um, with your PJ, your, your pinion juniper and um, your pinion, pinion pine and Utah juniper. Um, for those, we recommend you know one and a half to two times um, between those trees. So let's say, I don't know, your, your pinion's 10 feet. You multiply that by two. And then you want to have a spacing of 20 feet between those trees. I could go on and on about cheatgrass. Um, we know it's incredibly flammable. Um, do, I'm just going to ask folks, do you guys know what cheatgrass is? You know, it looks like um, it's incredible flamm incredibly flammable. Um, and they can produce these really fast, hot fires. And, and you, sometimes you can't outrun them. And so we recommend that there's no cheatgrass within 30 feet of your home. Okay, so this is actually a really cool um, little table. This uh, talks about slope and how far your defensible space should extend from your home. Um, we actually have this in our Fire Adapted Communities publication, but basically the column on the left shows the vegetation type and the row on the top shows um, your, your slope. So we're gonna use my house as an example. I live in Reno um, and my vegetation type in my backyard is, is sage and rabbit brush. So then that puts me in the shrubs and woodland. Um, little uh, area. And I actually have a really steep slope in my backyard. I mean, I've, I've gone down there and I've picked weeds and I've fallen and I've, I've injured myself. I have a 40 degree slope. It's super steep. So that means that my defensible space needs to extend 200 feet away from my house. 
sometimes your defensible space is going to extend into a, a neighbor's property or I, I don't know federal agency property. Um, and sometimes you can ask those those individuals or, or you know the the governmental agency and say, hey, you know what? Can can I do defensible space that extends into your property? And and sometimes neighbors say yes, and sometimes agencies say yes. So um, just keep that in mind. Okay, so now we're going to go into um, home hardening. Um, and again, I'm, I'm doing this super quick. We do have a recording of us going over defensible space in depth um, on our website, livingwithfire.com. We also have another presentation um, uh, that goes in depth about home hardening, evacuation. Again, livingwithfire.com. You can go on and view one of our Zooms. But um, we, we worked with a, a group of individuals and we created a publication um, uh, about reducing the, the wildfire threat upon your home um, and working on home hardening. And it covers all of these concepts, roofs, rain gutters, eaves, vents. And I'm only gonna go over a few because I have such a limited amount of time, but um, you know, we should have this publication here. Um, but anyway, if, if we don't, I'm pretty sure we have it, but if we don't, it's on our, our website, livingwithfire.com. Um, vents are actually one of the easiest things that you can retrofit. Um, so we recommend having a one eighth of an inch wire mesh. It's a non-combustible corrosion resistant metal mesh screening on your attic vents and your crawl space vents. Um, and, and just because it, it really prevents those embers from getting into your vents and then igniting your home from within. Um, I actually replaced mine in my crawl space fence. Um, I need to work on my attic fence, but I, I did a quick like Google search and I found like a, a stainless steel one eighth of an inch wire mesh. Um, you also want to avoid um, storing combustibles near your attic and your crawl space fence. Um, some people like to have like boxes of like, I don't know, books or clothing. Um, you don't want to have it near your attic vent just because if like, you know, embers were to get in, then it can ignite that stuff. So maybe just move it towards the center of your attic or your crawl space or, or just not have it there at all. And then you always want to inspect your vents annually. Eaves. Um, so eaves were designed so that airflow can go in through your vents and then um, be expelled at another side of your house. And they're really good at taking in that air. Um, and sometimes they're really good that they also take in embers. And so um, we recommend um, enclosing your eaves, um, just creating these uh, soffited eaves. And then you also wanna have, there's this strip vent right here, the strip vent that still allows air in, and, and that's just gonna um, you know, allow air in, but it's, it's still, you still need to have those one eighth of an inch wire mesh on those vents too. So how can you reduce the vulnerability of your siding? Um, you know, I, it's really important to have non-combustible siding like stucco or, or fiber cement siding. Um, sometimes it's super expensive. Um, I want to say about, I don't know, nine, six years ago, I priced it for my house and it was like 30 grand. I'm sure it's double that now with inflation. Um, and so it can be really, really expensive. And sometimes you can do like a local replacement, meaning that you only replace like a portion of it. Um, so maybe a really vulnerable part of your home. Um, my home is, um, is, is less than 30 feet next to my neighbor's home. So I, if I were to do a local replacement and then just get uh, fiber cement, then I would probably just do it between my home uh, neighbors. Um, so on the side of the home. And um, so help, you know, reduce the prices. Um, you also want to ensure that, you know, there's a, the, the six inch, uh, bottom six inches of, or non-combustible. Typically homes have this like, you can see it right here. Typically homes have like this, um, like concrete six inch, like um, barrier at the bottom at the foundation. And so um, some people like to cover it up because they think it's ugly. Um, we don't recommend doing that. I mean, just, just keep that there. Um, and so uh, that, that's another thing to consider. Um, attached decks, how many of you have decks? Okay, we got a few, I'll go over this. Um, so, you know, you, you really, when you are doing defensible space around your home, you want to create enough defensible space under your deck and, and uh, five feet around your deck. Um, so uh, I think I cut out, so I'm gonna say that again. So you wanna have defensible space. You wanna remove all that dead vegetation, dried leaves, pine needles from underneath your deck and five feet around your deck. Um, and if your deck happens to overhang on a pipe, 
if your deck, I'm going to say that again because I cut out, if your deck happens to over a slope, then you really want to create more defensible space downhill the slope. Um, you want to increase, if, if you are unable to replace your decking for like a non-combustible option, you want to have, um, you know, like a, a quarter of an inch gap between your deck boards so that vegetation can fall down below and then you can clean it out. Um, we also recommend, um, you know, having steel joists. Um, if a, a wildfire is threatening, you know, you really want to remove all of your, um, like, furniture, your cushions, um, you know, pretty decoration, stuff like that that can ignite. Um, I am in the boat where I don't have enough money to replace my deck, um, but you can do a replacement. And, and here's a little tip right here. Um, you can replace this board that is closest to your house with like a like a metal board or um, like a, a um, like a, a I don't know like a, a metal decking board I guess and then um, you can also have like a, a metal flashing that extends six inches above and below between um, the deck and your house so that if you happen to do have I don't know, pine needles or, or leaves that have blown up into that zone and they have ignited, you, you have that metal flashing to provide a barrier between that ignited vegetation in your home. So the publications, um, the left one is choosing the right plants for Northern Nevada's high fire hazard area. Um, there's a wildfire retrofit guide and um, the fire communities publication. And we have, Right. I'm gonna pop in here. Yeah. Um we sorry, it was hiding at the bottom of a box. So I just pulled it out if you guys didn't see it before. So the wildfire how much of a guide is out there now. Awesome. Thanks, Megan. Okay, so I'm also gonna go over a bit about evacuation. Um I've actually been evacuated twice, and so evacuation is really near and dear to my heart. Um I'm, i I I usually tell like a joke about how my neighbor didn't know what to do and he just grabbed an expensive bottle of wine and, and then just ran out of his house. Um, but I mean, we, we don't want to be like that. We really want to be prepared. Um, if, if somebody were to ask you to evacuate um, in five minutes, do you think you could do it to have enough supplies for 72 hours? Most people say no. Um, and so I'm just going to go over just a few tips for folks um, just in the interest of time. The most forgotten item is medication. Um, so, oh man, I didn't even walk that far. So if, um, if there's any sort of medication that you need to have on a daily basis, you, you definitely should be packing that. Um, I need to have my allergy pills every day. So I have these all over the place. Um, I actually have an evacuation go bag in my car at work and at home because you don't know where you're gonna be if a wildfire comes. Um, and then, um, I think it's also really important to, if you have pets, practice evacuating or just practice, you know, putting your, your small pets in crates or, or putting your, your large animals like, like horses, um, you know, livestock in, into um, trailers. Um, there's a lot of people who they haven't even, they haven't even loaded up their animals in trailers yet. And, and you don't want to be trying to load up your animals in a trailer when there's a wildfire. Um, it's really, really important to practice this stuff. If you have to go to an evacuation shelter, you need to have a, a crate for your pet. Um, and sometimes people don't have that. Um, so, and, or maybe your, your pet isn't used to it. You know, you don't wanna be evacuating when your pet's crawling over all over your lap in the car. It's really stressful, not only for you, but for them too. Um, hopefully it doesn't cut out so I can walk over here. I've got this really cool thing right here. It's a flashlight. It's a chargeable flashlight and a radio, and I can um, charge my phone on it too. I really love this thing. I got it at like, I know you can get it on the internet. I've seen it. Um, like, is it working? Yeah, it's working. Um, I love this thing. I have this just in case, even when the power goes out, I have something. Um, what else do I have? So defensive, so I, when we talked about defensible space, um, you really need to, um, you know, main, create and maintain defensible space yearly. Plants grow back, but you also need to create and maintain your go bag too. Um, once I created a go bag, and then a couple years later, I looked at it and I had 
you know, I have a five-year-old now. I mean, at the time she was like three or four and she was already potty trained, but I had a bunch of diapers in my go bag and I was like, oh, this is bad. I haven't even updated this. So, you know, things expire, um, your needs change. So you should be, you know, changing out things in your go bag. My little tip is like, I use these little packing cubes. And so I um, actually pack um, things for, for my whole family in these packing cubes. I also, um, if you look right here, I just don't want this to cut out. Um, this is actually my, my um, personal toiletry bag, but I can fit all of my family's toiletries in here. And it's really handy. Um, I, I always have it packed. And when I have to travel, like, you know, I traveled to Elko today and I just grabbed this and I already have everything that I need. Um, and so by using this, when I travel, then it tells me like, okay, what was expired? What do I need? What can I change out? It keeps it up to date by using that. Oh, geez. Okay. What else? Um, does anybody here have horses? Okay, great. Um, I know this can be controversial. Um, you know, I mean, if, if, if you have to let go of your horse, think Megan. <laughs> If you, if you are unable to, um, you know, load up your horses and, and you have to let your horses go, um, you know, make sure that you don't have a lead on them. Um, those leads can actually be, you know, entangled in, in a tree or a branch. Um, there's actually these um, main tags that we have. I, I have a picture of it. If somebody's really interested in it, I can show it to you. It's later on in a, a slide way past this, but um, you can write your information on the main tag and it stays on their main. Um, if you have to let go of your animal, um, having like a, a grease pen and just writing your phone number on the side of their body is really helpful instead of writing on their hooves. Um, you know, animals aren't going to want uh, somebody random to come up and look at their hoof. But if you can see, you know, a phone number on the side of their body, people are more likely to, you know, call you up and be like, hey, is, is this your animal? Um, but just it's, it's also really important to um, have everybody in your household know how to load up these animals. Um, sometimes in households, only one person knows how to load up um, horses or livestock. Um, one person only knows how to drive the, the um, trailer. Um, but what if that one person isn't home? So, you know, everybody should be knowing how to do this. Let's see if I missed anything else. Um, those are just my main points. We do have a wildfire evacuation checklist up here. Um, if you hadn't grabbed it, um, I'll probably pass it around here later on. Um, it, it is on our website. We have updated it. Um, there's a lot of great things in here. Like you should be locking up your home after you leave. Um, you don't want to leave your home unlocked. Um, what else? Um, I do have a question for, for fire agency folks. Um, what if... Um, should, should people leave their sprinklers on if they have to evacuate? Or what's the water pressure like? Yeah, nope. I agree. And that's why it's really, really important to reduce the wildfire threat upon your home, do defensible space, do home hardening. Um, and for those of you on Zoom, who, if you didn't hear what was said, um, they tell folks that try to not eat, turn on your water before you leave because they have limited water use. Is that what I was? Okay, good. Good. I said that right. Um, that's all I have. Um, and I'll save uh, questions for the end and I will hand this over to Jill. Thank you, Jamie. All right. We're going to talk about uh, fuels reduction and shared stewardship. And um, this is going to be through the U.S. Forest Service. And I'm going to turn the time over to Josh Nichols first. Thank you. Uh, so good evening, everybody. My name is Josh Nichols. I'm the district ranger here for the U.S. Forest Service. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to speak a little bit about shared stewardship to you all. Uh, it's a theme that you've heard a couple times already tonight. You know, everything that we try to do, we try to do interagency. So for forever and ever, we've all responded to wildfires as an interagency approach with all of our state, federal, and county partners. And really the objective behind shared stewardship is to start bringing our fuels reduction programs and some other aspects of our fuels program into more of a collaborative interagency approach. So about 
three years ago now, uh, we signed a <clears throat> Nevada shared stewardship agreement that includes all of the federal and state agencies in Nevada and incorporates a bunch of our other partners, such as Elko County, uh, our local utility companies, NDOT, um, Spring Creek Homeowners Association, our tribal partners, and so on. And really the goal behind shared stewardship is for us to look at all of the project work that's being done on different jurisdictional uh, lands and try to tie those together. So try to do more multi-jurisdictional interagency projects, expand fuels treatments, expand noxious weed treatments to cover more area and reduce the threat of wildfire. Um, so there's a local area working group here in Elko of which I am the chair. Uh, we meet every other month or so to talk about what projects each agency is doing and look for opportunities to expand that and incorporate additional partners or find additional funding sources to expand. Um, so I, I can turn it over to uh, our fuels program lead, Stefan, to talk about some of the projects that we're actually doing on national forest system lands. Uh, so he can speak to a bit of that. Thanks, Josh. My name is Stefan Goring, fuels technician, Humboldt Toyabi National Forest. Uh, with this shared stewardship project, we've been working on our hazardous fuels reduction in the canyon. There was work done in 2015. And so we're going back through with the maintenance phase as well <clears throat> to uh, work through that Lamoille Canyon Road. There was a lot of disturbance on that road last year uh, through that Thomas Canyon Cabin Owners Association as well. And then working on our noxious weed treatments at the mouth of the canyon and working together to um, share funds or prioritize workload across the different landscapes. We've got another project in the forest near Jarbage that is in the NEPA phase right now. That is to perform hazardous fuels reduction around Jarbage. Uh, we've met with Elko County's um, manager as well as the road department to discuss issues and concerns that they have with that road that goes from that Charleston to Jarbage and Jarbage North. We've also got a project down near Overland, Overland Pass Habitat Improvement Project. That's an example of us working with Ely BLM to do the pinion juniper uh, reduction for wildlife habitat. And mostly this presentation this evening is about hazardous fuel reduction around communities, but we also have Ruby Lake Estates, which is on the east side of Harrison Pass. That's been another uh, hazardous fuel reduction, wildlife objectives, project uh, to better bolster Ruby Lake Estates. When we're looking at some of these areas that we're looking to do work in, we're looking at the Elko County Fire Plan, looking at those evaluations of how those um, areas adjacent to the forest were rated, uh, extreme, very high, high, um, and what can still be done. It might be in a little bit of an older document, but there's always room to improve forest conditions for us. I'll pass it on to Rich. He's our fire prevention officer. And thank you. Hello, thanks, Stefan. I'm Rich Martinez. I'm the fire prevention officer for the district. We cover what 1.3 million acres and we have one prevention. So much like BLM, we're very limited on the resources that we have, but we go out there and, and try and do the best job possible. Anytime that we have homeowners give us a call or to have a concern, we take those calls and we take them seriously. And we'll make our way out there and try and mitigate whatever issue we have at that time. We work real closely with all the cooperators in this area. So most recently, I would say the fire in Osino last year is a good example of how we do that. When that call went out, all the partners here were there. Elko County was there, the Forest Service was there, the BLM. And then all the folks started coming from the outer areas. BLM brought their engines over. I think Twin Falls came over with an engine, and then we started getting resources from Reno. A strike team came out of there, and of course, dozers from all over the place, as well as aircraft. So that's how closely we work here with, with our partners again. And it's a great deal, and I wish other people around the nation could see how well we do that here. 
and that's just wanting to get the job done for you. We're here for you. We're here for the public. We're trying to get that fire out as soon as possible. Knock it down, keep it from burning homes, and try and get some of that vegetation back. So at any time that you do have any questions, feel free to contact us at our office. We're always available. Our number is 775-738-5171. And that is also the good number for firefighters. We're always looking for firefighters. And I probably speak for all the agencies. It's, it's tough out there. So we need everybody's help. If you know somebody that's interested and wants to work for a federal agency, it's a great job. We love it. We have an engine here uh, out of Markleyville. They're covering because our engine's out this year. So uh, we'll bring them in anytime, and we would love to hire local people. So call that same number. Ask for Division Chief Joe Powell, who's sitting right back there. He'll take that call, and, and uh, we'll try and bring more folks on. That's all I got. Thank you. Okay. Now, Clint um, Mothershed is here with um, Bureau of Land Management. Is he here? It's not. Okay. All right. So then we'll move on to um, Coralie Dittman. Coralie's with the Nevada Division of Forestry, and she's going to talk about fuels reduction and stewardship as well. Can I have a? Yep. <laughs> Yep, if you guys want to stand right up here, that would be awesome. All right, hi everyone, my name is Corley Dittman. I'm the resource manage management officer for the Northern Region and Nevada Division of Forestry. So my role with the I write most of our fuels reduction grants. I work with communities with fuel uh, hazardous fuels. And one of the big ones that we're doing right now in the Spring Creek Association is a Western State Fires Management Hazardous Fuels Grant. And we've working with BLM and Elko County Fire. Um, <clears throat> The first track that we completed was the Spring Creek 2 track. Sorry, it's this one over here. And it's about 278 acres. I don't know if any landowners have seen our tractor and Modex out there. And we have reduced all the fuels within the green spaces about 100%. Um, this is to help prevent wildfire from starting in the community and working out, out into BLM land and private land, you know, taking out other homes. And... And then, so now we're on to the 100 track and the 300 track, and our crews are currently working down over by the baseball fields where there's a couple hundred acre parcels, which are almost completed. And then we'll be moving on to the horse area, Oops, sorry. Um, in which we've seen, we did some mowing last year. We actually saw this as a benefit. There was a small fire around 4th of July due it to a uh, firework that got into the area by horse bus, which uh, NDF helped mow down and we were able to control the fire but under less than an acre. So super beneficial. And then going off with shared stewardship, we're working with Forest Service down in the South Rubies, helping her, uh, reduce fuel loads on pinion juniper. And for future uh, fuel breaks, we just got awarded a grant in Clover Valley where we're going to do a uh, fuels break on uh, right against Forest Service land to protect that community over there. Oh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, BLM is working on, uh, Clint's not here, but they're working on a whole story map of this project. But we do have on Nevada Division Forestry's website, we do have some more information on our ongoing fuels reduction pro projects. So, so just on NDF. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce David Brown. David is with uh, Nevada Division of Transportation, and he'll talk a little bit about evacuation. How you doing? Uh, David Brown, I'm the Highway Maintenance Manager for the Elko Subdistrict. Uh, we take care of uh, everything from uh, Dumphy to Wendover, down to Loggies Junction towards Ely, up to Jackpot, Waiahe, out to Jigs, down to Alpha, so that's kind of a big area uh, for out here. We have the major evacuation route, probably the only major evacuation route. So we get a lot of calls. Um, if you think about that road, there's probably five lanes per se. So if we had a major evacuation, uh, most people would probably be trying to either head into Elko to get 
out of the Spring Creek area. So we would probably try to open up some more lanes that direction, uh, limit the others the other way. Uh, we have enough traffic control devices that we try to maintain uh, right there in the Elko area. We also have DMS boards that are very helpful for information. We have message boards. So we uh, try to get out any of the communication needed by any of the agencies, as long as with ourselves trying to mitigate, uh, I guess, uh, panic and try to uh, get people safely out of the areas. Um, we get questions all the time about secondary routes. Um, for that, everybody knows that uh, you're dealing with private properties that we do not own. Uh, the Spring Creek Association has part of that. Uh, Elko County has part of that, but as well as landowners. And there would have to be, you know, a lot of planning, which I think we're in the, the pre-planning of it. Uh, all agencies are, I think, on board to try to help with that. But as of right now, we have the one route. Uh, is there any questions? So I think that would depend upon where the emergency is, right? Uh, if it was on the summit, I think this would be the priority. Uh, if it was out this direction, maybe towards Corral Lane or something, uh, we'd probably utilize both. Uh, there's a lot of uh, landowners with, this uh, or they said, um, I think the horse palace alone could not handle all those. So depending on what the emergency was, I think that would be dependent on where we sent people. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the benefits that we do have, uh, there is quite a few of us that are supervisors that are out of here that do get to take our emergency vehicles home. So we can respond within five to 10 minutes. A lot of people do not think about, uh, you know, as far as personnel, they do have to get over the summit too, to get to the main yard, to get emergency vehicles. but we can respond pretty quickly and efficiently by doing that. Question I have, um, will we be told where to evacuate? So I think I mean, we, as a group and with the interagency dispatch center, I think collectively, uh, as long as you have the proper communications, whether it be radio or uh, you know, you're trying to gather your, your personals and get out of there. I, I would not think that uh, a television would be adequate, adequate at that time, but you know, radio, every car hopefully has one. Uh, you know, neighbors, word of mouth, social media these days. So as long as you have a phone. Um, and like I said, you know, we, we do have message boards, but those take a little bit to get uh, out, but we do have the DMS boards like uh, both sides of Elko that we can provide information immediately. And then also NDOT has the 511. So, you know, those are the tools that we do have. We actually had another question on Zoom about communication. So I feel like you covered radio, the NDOT boards. Um, does anybody want to speak about who's like an authority about social media? I just learned from one of the firefighters about some Facebook groups to be a part of if you want to keep up to date. If anybody in the audience knows, feel free to raise your hand and I can, because uh, I'm not an expert on Elko social media, Facebook groups, but yeah. We have the Twitter uh, EIDC2. Uh, that's the number two, not TWO. That's often tweeting new starts or updates on fires. EIDC, Elko Interagency Dispatch Center. Oh, thank you. Um, I think we had another, does anybody else have any questions? Um, we had a question for Alex on Zoom uh, <laughs> about the and the energy. So do you wanna come up? Um, so specifically they were talking about um, projects between Spring Creek and Pleasant Valley. I was wondering if you could speak to that if you knew. <laughs> you know, 
got to answer that. Uh, we've been working towards Pleasant Valley. We're pretty much there as far as some of the pole grubbing. Uh, some of the tiered zones that MV Energy has set up for us kind of end right there at Pleasant Valley. So it's going to be a pause there. Uh, we're going to refocus our efforts on other tier two zones, which is more of uh, Long Elko all the way out east to Halleck and then towards Adobe Summit. But uh, as we get done with tier two and move towards tier three, probably towards the end of 2022, then continuing out more towards Pleasant Valley Lamoille. I hope that answers their question. Well, so I guess question. we'll find out in Thanks, the comments. Um, I'm, so I'm, I'm here representing MV Energy, but I am just the weather guy. <laughs> but, okay, sorry. But, so maybe that wasn't but for no, you. Sorry. No, the, Clancy, though, uh, Elko County, they are actually the ones out doing the work. So like uh, Clancy is actually very involved with that. Perfect. So. Okay, so this is another communications question. Um, so I'll just, Alex, do you mind handing the mic to whoever wants to take it? Um, so <laughs> in the communications realm, doing wildfire, doing an, an evacuation, I assume, um, let's see, what kind of communications are going to be like on the ground, I guess is what they're asking. Like, and how will they communicate, not just evacuation, not just like uh, evacuation centers, but how will they also communicate roadblocks, road closures? That, that might be an dot question. So again, for uh, any of the uh, traffic uh, information these be out there, we'd put it on 511. We have the DMS boards, we have the message boards, uh, the sheriff's office, the NHP, we all work together. I think every agency has a PIO office. So what you can expect from the fire crews coming in uh, in the event of a large wildfire through let's say Spring Creek, we'll typically get together with the sheriff's office or local law enforcement. They'll get on their loudspeakers and start driving through your neighborhood, letting you know there's a fire nearby and to evacuate. So once they're doing that, we also have those same capabilities in our fire trucks. We're hitting sirens, voicing that out for our loudspeakers to evacuate. We'll send our crews in to help assist you if you need help getting somebody out of your house, getting into your car. We're not going to help you pack it. You should be ready to go. We'll get you in there and get you out. The last thing we want is to bottleneck with you folks while you're trying to get out and we're trying to get in. So she, Jamie talked about a go bag, always be ready to get out. So when you do that, that communication works real easy. If you're ready to go and we're coming in, we, we don't have to do too much knocking on doors. I've been involved in several Santa Ana wind fires in Southern California. Been a lot of been involved in a lot of evacuations and some people don't make it out. These, these are fires ha happening in the middle of the night. So be aware that somebody knocking at one o'clock in the morning or pounding your door, there could be something going on, especially what a great example for the weather that we're having right here today, Alex. Hot, it's windy out there. It, it, it could flare up at any time. It's going to go through the night. Tomorrow's going to get worse. So be ready for that. And just that's get, gathering situational awareness. It's what we call SA in our business. Gather that awareness. You see it's hot, it's windy, something could happen. Just be checking the news. Always be always be listening to uh, the radio. I listen to the radio a lot. They'll, they'll say something about the fire. They love to jump on news like that. And then, of course, our websites, Humble Valley National Forest. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. You can see we'll, we'll throw alerts out as soon as they know something's going down. Thanks, Rich. Um, and then... Oh, sorry, Jill. Um, one more question, a follow-up to that fuels question about the power lines. Um, what is being done uh, in, as far as like weed abatement in places that have been cleared? Um, I'm not sure if this is a typo or if this is a place, but uh, specifically Dyer's Wood, is that a place? Noxious yeah. weed, okay. So uh, in addition to the work that they're doing with the power pool uh, grubbing down to mineral soil, um, they do apply herbicides, so making sure that we don't create a bed for cheatgrass uh, and making that situation worse next year. So taking down the soil is good, but there is an herbicide applied um, along those poles and also along the right-of-way that is cut with um, the mowers and everything else. 
trying to keep track of those noxious weeds and keep them from growing back. So there is herbicide applied. Um, it's just kind of depending on the time of year as far as when it's most effective. So sometimes um, if we are grubbing in the middle of the summer, that herbicide probably won't come till fall and it's a little bit more effective. Cool. Thank you. Oh, we have a question. Do you So right now it's being applied once a year. Uh, it's just dependent on how effective it is. If we need to uh, bump that up a little bit more, then uh, this is the first year with it. So as we see some areas that are growing back a little bit more than we want, we're going to adjust the formula and adjust the frequency for that too. Yeah, they're using the, the pelletized that takes it down and never grows back. Yeah. Okay, and then the next question from the same uh, person was if they are currently, if there's currently an infestation um, of noxious weeds, who can they call about that? I think, and I'm assuming because since the questions have been around the power lines, I think they're talking about the areas that were treated. Yeah, if it's, uh, yeah, if it's power line specific, uh, feel free, definitely give, uh, give us a call. We can go ahead and take a look at that uh, non-powerline specific. Coralia. HTF for okay, we have someone going to take this one over here. So Stefan Goring, Humboldt Tabby National Forest. I believe that you can report those noxious weeds to NDA, um, and NDA may be able to coordinate uh, some treatment for that. Um, Nevada Department of Agriculture. Can and you if you're in association, you can also contact Spring Creek Association. We do have some integrated pest management resources, not a lot, but you know, that are based here, but we can always contact our IPM um, staff in, in other counties for help with that. Well, we wanna thank everyone for coming out tonight. Um, please, if you want to get some more dinner, feel free to grab food. Um, but we, we want you to finish doing your evaluation or your poll at, at your um, table. And then also, uh, those of you who are on Zoom, if you will also do the poll, that will shortly. And please do not forget to take a rake home with you, or you can take a couple if you'd like. <laughs> and if you know, if you have some friends who would love a a wonderful rake. Um, we'll have the rakes at the extension office. We'll have them in our, our back courtyard. And so if you know someone who could really use the rake, you can tell them to come by the office at 701 Walnut Street in Elko. Um, and our office hours are 8 to 430. And we will happily provide them with a rake. Cool. Thank you guys for coming. Um, and it's a small group, but I know that you guys all have friends. So please share this information with folks. Grab as many publications as you guys want. Do we have a question? Yay, good, that's awesome. Cool, thank you guys.